I just pressed the Let's Go Live button. So we're waiting for the stream to fire up across the internet. And usually that takes a second or two. A little bit of activity going on here today, wasn't there? So we're going to dive into some of that. Now, normally what we want to do on this Saturday, the special edition of the broadcast, is to get into the Digital Bill of Rights. We did this last week. And last week we had a no politics policy. But today is a little bit uh, unusual. So we're going to get into a little bit of the Donald Trump impeachment news. Let me just double check and make sure that we're alive and well. And it looks like so we are. And let's Donald go ahead Trump and mute that. News. Apologies there. All right. All right. So let's talk about the big news of the day. Donald Trump was just acquitted for the second time. A second time historical, you could say. Many people are saying this was historical. This was the cover of CNN just a few minutes ago. And you can see acquitted again. When I saw this, it sort of reminded me of that scene from Breaking Bad when he's like, he keeps getting away with this. How can he keep getting away with this? CNN, of course, is not happy about it. So uh, McConnell was on the House floor just a few minutes ago. Donald Trump and their team, of course, uh, tr reacted to the recent acquittal we have donald trump statement here and um it was kind of a kind of a doozy of a day we woke up this morning thinking that it was going to be sort of procedural yesterday was the, uh, the trump and his defense team they were wrapping up their arguments and we sort of thought that they were done the closing arguments had been finished they were going to wake up today have some final debate on some of the questions that were that were coming in yesterday and it was going to be sort of a foregone conclusion that they were going to vote and then there was a little bit of a fireworks going on this afternoon and what happened was i think the house managers over from the democratic side they wanted to call witnesses in and so many of us were sort of scratching our heads saying wait a minute the trial is over you already presented your case you already had the opportunity to call witnesses and you had agreed prior to the trial starting to not do that. That should have been something that uh, was investigated or discussed prior to the start of trial. You can't just, after a trial has concluded, say, well, we didn't really like the evidence that we heard, so we're going to go out there and gather other evidence, right? Think about this in a, in a criminal context. The government brings their case against somebody. They present their case in chief. They have their their presentation. They stop. The defense presents. The government, you, you have open and closing arguments. The government can present some rebuttal witnesses. You have one set of closings. The defense closes again. The government closes again, but they're not reintroducing new witnesses. They're not presenting their case, waiting for the defense, waiting for the defense closing argument, and then saying, Judge, hey, uh, before we wrap this up, before the jury goes and votes, we have all of this other evidence we want to just bring in. We, for, we, you know, we forgot to call that guy, forgot to call this guy. No, that's it. That's the end of the game, right? You have one trial. You get to bring your case, bring your A game, or don't bring it at all, and don't bring uh, you know, criminal charges. In this case, these were impeachment charges, but they were largely I think, in my opinion, analogous to a criminal proceeding. So they kind of botched all of that. CNN, uh, you know, says acquitted again. Washington Post, very much the same. A lot of, I think, Democrats are very disappointed today. A lot of Trump Republicans or, you know, the MAGA movement, they're very happy about this today. And so uh, let's let's break it down just a little bit before we dive into the digital Bill of Rights. All right. So who voted to convict Donald Trump? Of course, all the Democrats did. And then we have... It looks like Richard Burr. These are these are seven Republicans. The total vote was 57 to 43. So, of course, you need two thirds in order to convict a, a president sitting or former president. And they didn't get that. They were 57 to seven uh, to 43, which is actually a little bit you know closer than I than I thought uh, it might be. I thought it was going to be. I mean, I, what I mean is closer to impeachment. I thought that that number might be around 55 to 45 ish. And nope, it was a little bit higher than that. So Richard Burr, Susan Collins, I think was pretty much a, a foregone conclusion. Same with Lisa Murkowski, Mitt Romney, Ben Sass. All of them, I think, had already uh, indicated that they were going to be voting this way. Richard Burr, I think, was a surprise to some people, as was Bill Cassidy and Pat Toomey. But, you know, it was uh, 57 to 43. So seven Republicans flopped over. You can guarantee that they are going to be facing primaries in their next uh, campaigns, but many of them just got recently elected. So like Ben Sass, for example, he's got another six years for people to cool down or you know, five and a half years until people cool down about this particular vote. And after that point in time, you know, maybe people have forgotten about Donald Trump or maybe he's back in the White House again. Who the heck knows? Well, it is probably not going to be over there. So as soon as this was done and over, Mitch McConnell, who 
voted to acquit the president, former president, came back out on the Senate floor and apparently was hinting that he would be supportive of criminal charges now moving forward against Donald Trump. And so here's what he said. He said, or according to Marianne McKeany, She's a, a journalist, says, seems McConnell is calling for Trump's criminal prosecution. And she quotes him just from the floor, says President Trump is still liable for everything he did while in office as an ordinary citizen. He didn't get away with anything, yet we have a criminal justice system in this country. So and she says that's a Pontius Pilate move. So, you know, this is something that I the same point that I've been making here for a long period of time when. People were saying that there's this January exception that any president in the final month of their uh, term in office in January can suddenly commit all of these crimes and just get away with it. And I'm sitting here going, wait a minute, what? we have a Justice Department. Do you, do you not understand that? They could prosecute them. They could bring criminal charges against them if there was enough there. And so now we've got Mitch McConnell out there hinting theoretically that, well, maybe they're going to prosecute Trump and it's the Biden DOJ now. Maybe that sounds pretty attractive to them. And so this is the first sign of a massive rift out there in the party. We all saw this coming for a long time. I said, I feel sort of like the Republican Party is kind of dead in the water. There is this massive division, sort of a Trumpian contingent, Trumpian demographic, demographic. And then on the other side, you've got the mainstream sort of establishment politicians like the Mitch McConnell's. Mitch McConnell comes out, says, well, we kind of support criminal prosecution. Donald Trump Jr. comes back out and says, if only McConnell was so righteous as the Democrats trampled Trump and the Republicans while pushing the Russian collusion BS for three years or while Dems incited 10 months of violence, arson and rioting. Yeah, then he just sat back and did Jack S. So he's not happy about it. And I think that it's just going to continue this rift between the two sides. Uh, this was not particularly good. For the GOP as a party, I think that a lot of uh, the Republican senators are going to be on their heels for a foreseeable amount of time as a result of their votes to convict Donald Trump. It was symbolic, right? Didn't do anything. And they're going to have to you know, deal with that in the next primaries. Some of them are going to be facing consequences. Other of them will not, right? I think Murkowski, Collins, Romney, they're all very safe. They were voting their conscience. That's fine. But some of the other senators, they may be uh, they may be on their heels in the foreseeable future. So we'll see. Now, Donald Trump came out. His statement is as follows. I want to first thank my team of dedicated lawyers and others for their tireless work upholding justice and defending the truth. My deepest thanks as well to the United States senators and members of Congress who stood proudly for the Constitution. We all revere and the sacred legal principles at the heart of our country. Our cherished constitutional republic was founded on the impartial rule of law, the indispensable safeguard for our liberties, our rights, and or freedoms. He says it is a sad commentary on our times that one political party in America is given free press to denigrate the rule of law, defame law enforcement, cheer mobs, excuse rioters, transform justice into a tool of political vengeance, and persecute, blacklist, cancel, and suppress all people and viewpoints with whom or which they disagree. I have always and always will be a champion for the unwavering rule of law, the heroes of law enforcement, and the right of Americans to peacefully and honorably debate the issues of the day without malice and without hate. This has been another phase of the greatest... Uh, you know, witch hunt in the history of our country. No president has ever gone through anything like it. It continues to be, be because our opponents cannot forget the almost 75 million. So see, so now we're getting into, into some, some dangerous territory for YouTube. So we got to be careful here. He says, I want to convey my gratitude to the millions of decent, hardworking, law-abiding, God and country-loving citizens who have bravely supported the important principles in these very difficult, challenging times. We have a historic movement with the Make America Great Again movement in the months ahead. I have so much to share with you. We have so much to work to do ahead of us. We'll emerge with a vision for bright, radiant, limitless American future. Together, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. We remain one people. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. So generally a pretty a, a pretty uh, benign statement, right? Not much there. He says, I thought he was going to get into some of the voter fraud stuff, but he's not. He said 75 million people. Who voted for us just a few months ago we cannot forget about them so that was kind of the sentence that i gleaned over and you know i think it's a pretty benign statement i don't know what what youtube's going to do with this type of stuff if they're going to just start canceling people for reading his statement so we got to be careful about that i i know nobody likes that that we have to do that but we got to do it so uh generally overall reaction i thought you know i watched i was kind of in and out of it today this morning 
I think largely speaking, Van Derveen was very good. I thought that his performance today and his closing argument was pretty passionate and it was well done. He, he actually was weaving in a lot of the same issues that we talked about. Typically, what I would like to do is give the Democrats, you know, a thumbs up or, or give them some sort of a, a compliment today. But I think that they botched it largely. I mean, and, and that was unfortunate for their side. What we saw today was there was a rush to get witnesses in. They were going to sort of as this was coming to a close, there was this big movement. And I think they actually had the votes where they were going to be able to call witnesses. And it, I think five or six Republican senators joined in on them. It was like 55 to 45 or 56 to 44, whatever it was. And they were going to be moving forward to call witnesses. And a lot of people on the Republican side were up in arms about this over on Twitter. They were sort of their fireworks going off. I can't believe this is happening. And then Vanderveen came back out and he was scolding the other side saying, you know, OK, that's fine. We're going to have to haul these people back to my office. And he was getting a little bit of grief for that on Twitter. We're going to have to you know, deposition all these people. And then at some point. One of Trump's lawyers or some somebody who was working with his team, they came back out and they said, we've got we've got you know hundreds of people that, that are on our witness list. Everybody that, that, that the Democrats played in all of their videos, we want depositions. We want Nancy Pelosi. We want Hillary Clinton. We want Mayor uh, Bowser from D.C. We want everybody. And so the list just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they reached an agreement miraculously. Suddenly now the Democrats who were wanting these witnesses suddenly entered into this agreement where they basically got one written statement from the Republicans submitted into evidence. And it was for something that you know turned out to be irrelevant because he got acquitted. So on Twitter, a lot of the Democrats were very angry about that. And you're sort of seeing a rift over there as well. I think David, David Axelrod was on Twitter talking about uh, don't, don't blame the Democrats or, okay, you know, don't, don't, don't melt down over here because of what happened. This was a negotiated deal. This is the best thing that we could do. We got some evidence in that we would not have otherwise gotten in. And so don't, you know, don't lose your cool over this. And they proceeded to do that anyways, very upset about it saying, you know, this was such a damage to, to democracy and, you know, hurting America and all of those different comments. So a little bit of a rift happening over there, but I don't think that that is something that is, uh, going to be, matching the problems that the Republican have. Uh, Trump, I think he's still a threat moving forward. Obviously, this this is, I think, what the Democrats were trying to alleviate. And I mean threat, however you want to interpret that word. The Democrats think he's a threat to democracy. They think he's a threat to America. They think he's probably a threat to physical safety in this country. And they're very concerned about that. I think he is still a threat. If you are on that side of the aisle, you're going to use that word and say, well, that, that was a bad thing. Right. It's a horrible thing. If you're a Republican, you're saying this is great. Right. Because Donald Trump was not responsible for the incitement. He was not responsible for the insurrection. He was out there talking about a legitimate issue that many Americans also feel have some problem. They also have problems with them. And he is the only person talking about it. And so if that if that leader of that contingency of the country is sort of emasculated, right, is ha has their ability to be effective removed from them, then that the rest of that movement might just die. It might just sort of peter out. And I think that's kind of what the whole point of this impeachment was. That was kind of the goal of it. So now that that hasn't happened, Trump still has, whether he decides to run in 2024 or not, he still has the ability to do that. And that gives him some, pe some power, some leverage moving forward into future discussions. I already read that Lindsey Graham was going to be meeting with him and they're going to be talking about the future of the GOP. Trump is now a player at that game. If he had been convicted and removed and not allowed to run again, he can't be removed. He's already been removed. If he had been precluded from running again, then that would have sort of uh, removed his leverage from that equation. And I think he wouldn't have been invited to be a party to that conversation. So he's still a threat either way, whatever side of the aisle you're on, he is somebody who is still going to be effective and very relevant in American politics for the foreseeable future. Whether he, Whether or not he runs again, and, I, and there are a lot of people out there saying that'll never happen. His political capital is blown. I do not think that at all, folks. I do not think so. I mean, if this comes back in, in four years from now and you're talking about a Mitt Romney versus a, a, a Donald Trump in, in a Republican primary or a Ben Sass versus a Donald Trump again, in a general, he might he might lose. But in a primary, I'm not so sure. People are pretty disaffected with the Republican Party. And I think for very good reason. And then lastly, the last point I wanted to make is this this talk of criminal charges is just bananas. The fact that Mitch McConnell uh, 
is is hinting at that I just think is ridiculous and we've gone through enough of that in the last couple days the last the last week or so to detail what happened there we talked about incitement we talked about the Brandenburg test we ran through some of the case law to talk about free speech we talked about all the problems with causation proximate cause superseding intervening causes a lot of issues and I don't think that any of this stuff would have been admissible or even prosecuted in a court of law in a criminal proceeding. We'll see if that happens now, though, right? There may be prosecutors or U.S. attorneys around the, the country. We're already seeing that they are very excited about prosecuting Donald Trump. We've got, I think, Letitia James out of New York. We've also got there's another uh, there's another newly ele elected Democrat out of Georgia who's leading an investigation against Donald Trump over that Raffensburger phone call. And I think those are state level. Those are attorney generals and uh, attorneys general and their their uh, state level officials. But we may see somebody from the U.S. Uh, attorney's office from the Department of Justice now that it, there's the Biden White House in charge of it that wants to take this up and move forward with it. But I just don't think from a criminal standard that it would meet the threshold in order to move the case forward. So thoughts on impeachment. We're going to wrap that up, though and move on in into the real good stuff. This is the everlasting stuff. This is why we're doing a Saturday live stream because we want to talk about the Digital Bill of Rights. All right, so let me flop this over here. The Digital Bill of Rights, we started talking about this last week in our first workshop. Today's workshop number two. And what I want to do today is just go briefly through the original proposal of the first eight amendments that would be a part of a new Bill of Rights. And so we, we're we sort of in this stage right now where we're just playing around with these ideas. We're having fun. We're brainstorming a little bit, sort of calling it mental gymnastics, thinking about how this all might work. And so last week what we did is since I started hinting about this conversation or sort of teasing this idea and looking around at other people's work, work product and what the EU is doing and what some other you know sort of uh, free speech platforms are doing, I consolidated a list of what I thought were eight relevant amendments and it was just an opening argument it was just an opening position and what we what is what has happened since the last week is i got a lot of great input from a lot of other people and i got some stuff that i want to go through today on this workshop but but something else also came to to my attention when i was thinking through how to navigate processing a task of this this gigantic right thinking through how do we how do we establish what the next five, six, seven generations of digital life operate? How do we talk about those issues? It's a lot. There's a lot of brain power that goes into it. I am a lawyer, but I'm not a, a uh, bill of rights drafter, right? You know, this is a whole separate thing. This is a, this is a major policy decision, policy issue. You, you want to get a lot of minds involved. And so that's why we're just sort of playing around with these ideas. So these first eight, they, they were originally discussed last week. I want to go through them again and just remind you that these are open for interpretation, open for discussion. They're not, I'm not married to these at all. And we're going to see how I think that they're going to evolve as this conversation continues. And the other issue that I saw when I was going through these is that I think we sort of jumped the gun a little bit. I think I kind of got ahead of myself by just starting with this document. And I'm going to explain what I'm talking about right now. What I'm going to show you is just the, the standard Bill of Rights. It's the first eight amendments that I came up with, but we sort of we just sort of drafted those. Why do we need to do this? Where did this come from? And so what today, what I want to do today is go through what I'm calling the, the philosophical underpinnings of why this might be necessary. Because a lot of the criticism or a lot of the pushback, I wouldn't even say criticism, a lot of the the, the countering viewpoints were kind of saying, well, why do we really need this for? You know, we have all of these structures in place. We already have Section 230. You know, these are private companies. You don't have you, you don't have a right to you know interfere with any of this stuff. And so I needed to take a step back and just understand it from sort of a more fundamental level before we really start talking about implementing any of this stuff. Why? Where does it come from? What is the underpinning the justification for it in the first place. So briefly, again, let's run through the first eight, just so we have some context as we're moving forward. First one, digital freedom of speech. The internet shall have no law abridging the freedom of speech. Right to digital personhood. All users shall have the right to exist in their true identity on the internet. Right to deletion. The right to remove all data. Right to information. The ability of the user to move internet data between providers without impediment. The right to privacy. No user data shall be shared without user consent. 
We have the right to unfilter. Basically that you can view the internet through an unfiltered, uncensored, unrestricted lens. The right to due process. Providers of the internet services shall not deny users access to any port of a platform, any part of a platform without affording them due process. So you can't just be canceled without reason. And then number eight, the internet providers that comply with these prior bill of rights, they are protected through good faith protections. They're immune from liability in the court of law. And so those were the first eight, nine and 10. We're still sort of open for interpretation, open for discussion. I'm open to combining these two or separating them out. And what I want to do is show you some of the feedback that we got after last week's workshop. But before I do that, let's talk about this concept called the state of nature. And I want to just go back to sort of the very beginning. In political science, there is an idea, there's a whole sort of a handful of philosophers when they were thinking about how the world was composed and how it should be composed and how society should evolve and develop, they started with nature. They started with this idea that man and women were sort of born into this world that is whatever it is. And they define the state of nature differently. Some people say that it's very chaotic and that people are just mostly bad and they're out there naturally. We're just wanting to kill each other and take their property and take their goods because their only functioning interest is self-survival. Okay. That's one interpretation of the state of nature. And that's something that we're going to take a look at. There's also another interpretation of this as well, men are mostly good. Men and women are mostly good. And they're just trying to communicate together. They're all trying to reach enlightenment. And so if you started them both at the same beginning with a blank slate, how would things go, right? How would society evolve? How would men and women negotiate their world? Would it be more like a chaotic mess catastrophe? Or would it be something where there's some harmony and some reason and logic and some harmony there? And depending on how you define your state of nature, that's going to dictate how your government grows, how your principles are developed, the type of institutions you create, and so on. And so when we're talking about the digital world, when we're talking about a digital bill of rights and how things might work in the future, what I wanted to think of was, what is the digital state of nature? What is that? What does that look like? If we just took this all down to the fundamentals, what is the internet like in its most natural form? And if we can have a good understanding of that, then maybe we can build on some layers that are useful for us. And I'm going to explain this in a little bit more detail. So just follow me down here. We're sort of at the bottom level. We're talking about the state of nature. This is something that has existed in the real world. Philosophers and political scientists have talked about it a lot. A lot. They use this in their construction of how to propagate and create a functioning government. And that has largely been for the physical world. It's been for, you know, 17th century England. It's been for the Romans back, uh, you know, when they were around. It's, it's now in modern culture around the, the world, right? The way that the Chinese think about mankind, the state of their nature might be different than how we think about it here in the United States. And so you, you can really get into some, into some tricky subjects here about moral and cultural relativism, relativism and different things. But what we're talking about is, what is the fundamental conception of how we live and how does that apply in a digital world? All right, so let's take a look and let's define some of this stuff. The state of nature, according to Wikipedia, in moral and political philosophy, religion and social contract, there is an international law. It is the hypothetical life of people before societies came into existence. Philosophers of the state of nature theory deduce that there must have been a time before organized societies existed, and this presumption thus raises the questions as, what was life like before civil society? How did government first emerge from a starting position? What are the hypothetical reasons for entering a state of society by establishing a nation state? In some versions of the social contract theory, there are no rights in the, nature, in the state of nature, only freedoms, and it is the contract that creates rights and obligations. In other versions, the opposite occurs. The contract imposes restrictions upon individuals that curtail, curtail their, their natural rights. And we talked about this a little bit last week about sort of uh, active rights versus negative rights. You know, can, should the government be created to promise you certain things? Should you get health care? Should you get a place to live? Should you be guaranteed a job? Those are more positive, active liberties. 
The government is existing in order to give you something versus a negative right where the government is pre prohibited from interfering into your liberty, into your freedoms, which is much more analogous to what we have in the United States. The Congress shall make no law establishing the freedom of religion. They can't do anything about it. We know that they can. They can lock them down because of COVID and things like that. But in theory, they shouldn't be able to do that. It's a restriction. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here. What is the state of nature? And the way that I was thinking about this today was it looks sort of like a hierarchy like this. At the foundational level, we have the state of nature. And when you think about this in terms of the United States, we can go back and apply some of this through our history. The state of nature would have been, and you can debate about this, right? The, the Native Americans were here and we had slavery and all sorts of other things, but largely from a, from a conceptual standpoint, we had the migration of Europeans over to the new world and the new world was sort of a blank slate. It was different. It was a segment. It was a, it was a, a way for them to disconnect from the old world and recreate a land with a new, with new premises, without any presuppositions from the old world. And so you could arguably say, well, it was a kind of a state of nature, right? It was largely chaotic. They didn't have the same protections that they had. They had to sort of recreate a society here. And that gave them certain freedom to rethink how things would work in the world. So think about that as just the state of nature. They just got off the boats. They landed in the United States. Then what happened next? Well, they started to organize, right? They started to get tired of getting taxed. They, get, they got tired of you know, the British sort of trampling all over their rights, quartering troops in their home, collecting uh, money for taxes without representation back in the old world. And it became a problem. And so what happened? Well, they started to communicate. They started to congregate. The founding fathers wrote dozens of letters back and forth to each other in the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers. They debated what the world was. They entered into a state of nature without much structure. They were sort of carrying this baggage from the old world, and they started to discuss their principles and their concepts. And that's when they created the Declaration of Independence. Okay, And that was, that was the first document that came out. They declared their principles. They said, okay, all men are created equal. Okay, we know that we can have some criticisms about that now in 2021, but this was a big thing for them back in the 1700s. They defined what their principles were. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then from there, that's when they formed the government. The U.S. Constitution came about. They said, these are our principles. Based on these principles, we are going to create a government. The U.S. Constitution is formed. We start to get a clear threshold of, of what this country is about. Article 1, 2, and 3, we've got the branches of governments being set up. We know that we've got a Congress. We've got a legislative branch. We have an executive branch. We've got a judicial branch. We talk about the concept of federalism. We've got a, a big, you know, a bigger federal government than what we saw under the Articles of Confederation. And we have a system where the states retain a lot of their autonomy. That was the government that was created. From there, then we get the fleshing out of the institutions. Okay, now we're talking about, okay, well, we have a judicial department, a judicial branch of government. What do we have? Well, how, what, what, how can we enforce the concepts that we think are in alignment with our principles? What does justice look like? What does education look like? What does homeland security look like? These are the different pillars that our government establishes in order to keep our country out of a state of nature that is chaotic and problematic and into a new type of society that is more in alignment with the principles that we hold dear. Justice, education, equality. Those are the institutions then that the government helps to establish. Then society operates on top of that. With those protections, society is prevented from falling back down into the state of nature that is less organized, less free, less capable of helping you reach your life goals or reach that level of enlightenment. And so this is the structure that we sort of went through in our country. Now, a lot of individuals 
a lot of other philosophers have differing opinions on what the state of nature looks like. And one we can take a look at is from, well, before we get there, so we're going we're gonna to talk about Thomas Hobbes here in a minute. Now, a couple of the points I wanted to make before we move on here. These are, you know, this is stuff, this is stuff that is sort of written into law and code, but you have to understand as well, there's also culture that is sort of interwoven with all of this, right? We have a culture that supports this. Culture is not something that I think can be viewed in total isolation. It helps merge all of this stuff together. And this is why when you hear a lot of people say that you know, culture is number one, all of this other stuff is downstream politics and the structure of our society sort of downstream of culture. Edmund Burke talks a lot about this in his concept of the social fabric it sort of weaves everybody together. All of this stuff works together because we share a similar culture. And I think that's just an important point. One other quick point before we move on to Thomas Hobbes is the idea of many people today, I think, unfortunately, in, in America and throughout the world, they actually think that this kind of is reversed. So they would put principles maybe up here and they would put government down here. So they would say that to, to get us out of this state of nature, the government is necessary to be created and the government establishes what the principles are. So it's basically reversing these two concepts. Now, I'm sure that they would not think that that is a fair characterization of their positions, but I, I, I typically do. I mean, I really do. I think that when you identify your predominant principles, when you say, look, these are foundational, these are immutable, these are inalienable rights, we cannot lose these things. That's where you get things like the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion. We're saying that's inherent to us, the right to petition your government for a redress of grievances. That is a, those are principles that come out of the state of nature. They do not come out of the government. Okay, the government does not grant you that those rights or those privileges or those principles. Your right to bear arms, your right to be free from illegal searches and seizures, your right to be prohibited to be punished with cruel and unusual punishment. Those come from the principles that you deprive from the state of nature, not from the government. And unfortunately, we're seeing where people are starting to think for some reason that this is more important than the principles. That's why we're seeing a watering down of a lot of the principles. We're seeing free speech is suddenly, well, it's okay to, to, you know, to censor people and throw people off the internet because it's a private company. In other words, the institutions up here are more important. Society's you know, concerns, wants, and needs, and, and their concern about dangerous speech, it's more important than the principles. They're saying that they can do whatever they want. And I'm hearing a lot of people in this country say, you know what, you're right, they can do whatever they want forgetting about these principles, forgetting about the underlying basis for what made America so great. It, it is the principles. It's not the government giving people permission to do things and not do things. We're working from the principles and working our way up. All right, so now let's take a look. That's, that's, my, that's my opinion of it. That's my interpretation of it. Let's take a look at some of these other philosophers. All right, so first let's talk about Thomas Hobbes. So Thomas Hobbes was one of the first people that I had learned about. He wrote a book called Leviathan, and he had a very dark view of, uh, of the state of nature. So this came over from, there's, I think, the Stanford political, uh, uh, philo Stanford philosophy website. They say he's, his current reputation rests largely on political philosophy. The rest of this stuff is kind of irrelevant, but this is what the guy looked like. And he was predominant around 18, 1588 to 1679. And according to Wikipedia, his version of the state of nature, he says it's the natural condition of mankind. It was described in his, uh, his document called Leviathan. I think it was a book. And his earlier work called Decive. I don't know how to say that. Hobbes argued that natural inequalities between humans are not so great as to give anyone clear superiority. And thus all must live in constant fear of loss. That's the state of nature. Or violence. So that, quote, during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in a condition which is called war. And as such, such a war is of every man and against every man, which is a very dark way to think about things, right? I mean, and, and some people might agree with that. They might say that you need a very strong common power to keep them in awe. 
from his own language. So this is where you start to see you know, concepts like a monarchy, like a very strong monarchy or a, dic you know, a, a di dictatorship, right? That would be a very strong common power that would keep a lot of people in awe. And sort of the, the political conversation here is about, well, that's necessary. We need that because the natural state of things, the state of nature is so turbulent. We're in a constant state of war is what he said. There's constant fear of loss. There's constant fear of violence. And so you need this type of structure in order to make it so that you are not killed. You are not stolen from. You need to have a strong top so that you don't get killed in this state of war. He says this natural condition, meaning war of all against all, is how he described it. All right, so that's one interpretation of what the state of nature is. Then we get over to John Locke. John Locke comes a little bit later. So if we take a look, Hobbes was from 1588 to 1679. Then we get over to Locke, and he sort of picks up a little bit, 1632 to 1704. He was a British philosopher, Oxford academic, medical researcher, and he wrote an essay concerning human understanding in 1689, one of the first defenses of modern empiricism and concerns itself with the limits of human understanding. And so here's what Wikipedia says about him. He considers the state of nature in his second treatise on civil government, written around the same time of the exclusion crisis in England in the 1680s. For Locke, the state of nature, in the state of nature, all men are, are free to, quote, order their actions, dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it. Okay, and so that's where we get a lot of this idea that these are natural rights. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, and that law is reason. Locke believes that reason teaches that, quote, no one ought to harm another in his life, liberty, and or property. And many people will say that this is where the founding fathers got their concept of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but there are other scholars who don't like to attribute that to Locke. He says that those trans any transgressions as a result of that may be punished. He describes the state of nature and civil society to be opposites of each other, and the need for civil society comes in part from the perpetual existence of the state of nature. The view of the state of nature is partly deduced from the Christian belief, unlike Hobbes, whose ph philosophy, I'm sorry, philosophy is not dependent upon any prior theology. All right, and so they never, there, there was some debate that Locke was responding to Hobbes, and uh, you know, they're saying here that there's basically not much evidence of that. So that's another version of what the state of nature is. Okay, it's not this bland, absent, volatile state of war. It's, well, it's nature. There are laws of nature, and the laws that govern nature are reason. And so we can use that reason to then move forward and create a society that allows people to operate as long as they don't have harm for anybody else that impedes their life, liberty, or property. Doesn't sound bad. Then we get over to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau is another pretty important figure in history of philosophy, political philosophy, moral psychology, and his influence on later thinkers. Here's what Wikipedia said about him. Hobbes' view was challenged in the 18th century by Rousseau. He claimed that Hobbes, Hobbes was taking socialized, socialized people and simply imagining them living them outside a society in which they were raised. He affirmed instead that people were neither good nor bad, but were born as a blank slate and later society and the environment influence which way we lean. In his state of nature, people did not know each other enough to come into serious conflict and they did have normal values. The modern society and the ownership it entails is blamed for the disruption of the state of nature, which Rousseau sees as true freedom. Okay, so he's saying now that maybe people aren't born one way or the other. A little bit of a different interpretation than Locke, where sort of the natural, the natural order of the world is reason, and nature has a governing law that is based in reason. Rousseau is saying, well, kind of people are kind of blank slates, you know, and, and how you and how they're brought up in the society that you create, you can't take society out from the state of nature because that's kind of not reality. People are born into a society. So you have to consider that. And they're blank slates. And so society has an impact on how they develop and how they will mature into citizens. And so he takes that and spins off there. Then more modernly, we have John Rawls. 
Okay, John Rawls, 1921 to 2002, American political philosopher in the liberal tradition. So it's kind of a more modern political liberal political liberalism delineates the legitimate use of power in a democracy and envisions how civic unity might endure despite the diversity of worldviews that free institutions allow. Liberal foreign policy, permanently peaceful and tolerant international order. So kind of a modern thinker, right? Rawls used what amounted to an artificial state of nature. To develop his theory of justice, he places everyone in what he calls the original position. The original position is a hypothetical state of nature used as a thought experiment. People in the original position have no society and are under a veil of ignorance that prevents them from knowing how they may benefit from a society. So we don't know how great society is. They lack foreknowledge of their intelligence, wealth, and abilities. He reasons that people in the original position would want a society where they had their basic liberties protected and where they had some economic guarantees as well. If society were to be constructed from scratch through a social agreement between the individuals, these principles would be the expected basis of such an agreement. Thus, the principles should form the basis of real modern societies since everyone should consent to them if society were organized from scratch in fair agreements. So it's kind of just taking everything as it is and eliminating it and saying, all right, well, we're going to bring everybody back together. And they've got this veil of ignorance over their eyes where they can't see how good this could be. But if we can lift that veil up and we can say, look, we're going to create these agreements, these mutual agreements between each other, then we won't be at war. We won't be in a position where we have some economic problems. Okay. We would talk together. We'd say, Hey, I've got this skill. You've got this skill. Okay. We want some economic guarantees. We want some basic liberties protected, but we're going to come together as a, as a society and we're going to function together because that's the best for everybody. Once you realize that, once you're not so ignorant about how this can work so well, then things will be better. So that's his version of the state of nature. All right, so that's a little bit of a history lesson on some of the political science stuff. Very interesting. You can read into this for, uh, I think, two semesters, which is basically what I did. I had to really, really dig back down in there to remember some of that. But thankfully, Wikipedia exists, so they helped uh, get me up to speed. But this is, once again, this is what the hierarchy sort of looks like. The state of nature, how things are. Based on what you think that state of nature is, what are the principles that should come out of that? Now, you may disagree with that. You may say the state of nature is very warring and you basically need a government to come in and stop the war, stop the mayhem, stop the chaos. And then from there, you can establish your set of principles and out of your principles can come your institutions and your society. That's not the way that I like to think about it. I think that the principles are more immutable. They're more inalienable. They do come from whatever you want to call it, from your higher power, from God, from the state of nature. These are things that are more objective and they come from the world. They don't come from the government. So once you have those established, then you can work your way up the chain. And when I was thinking about this in terms of the digital bill of rights, it's the same conversation that Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Rawls were all having. They were trying to have this conversation saying, if we just wipe the slate clean in our, in our real society where we're dealing with cars and transportation and housing and corn prices and cattle futures and all of these things, how would we structure this? Well, have we ever had that conversation about the digital world or the internet? I mean, Elon's uploading people to the cloud here soon. I just listened, I was listening to Rogan, right? Pretty soon. Have we had a conversation about what this next level looks like? What is the state of nature of our digital world? What do we think that is? What, what, what are the conversations surrounding that? Is it, a, is it a state of war, like Hobbes said, where it's a bunch of, of sort of you know private companies, they can just monopolize different segments of the digital globe for their own gain, and everybody's out for its own, and we need you know, a big dictator-ish who can strike awe into the, into the populace to keep everybody in order? Do we want something more like Locke, where he's talking about, well, as long as you're not interfering with life, liberty, or property, you're kind of free to go. Do you want it like Rawls where you're guaranteed certain things? Like Rousseau where everybody's a blank slate. And once you start spinning off one way or another, maybe there's repercussions for you. What does it look like? So it's the same conversation. On the one side, we're talking about the physical world. What is the state of nature according to the political philosophers? Then we declare what they are. Then we form a government around it. 
then we create institutions and our society functions on top of it. What if we did the same thing with the digital world? What is the state of it? How do we want to create our digital world? Make that a little bit more of a triangle because that was looking concerning. What is the government? Okay, right now we're having a lot of conversations about this level, really. We're talking about Section 230. We're talking about kicking tech companies out of platform, you know, out of, out of, uh, you know, Florida is going to be making it difficult for them to get contracts. We're talking about the interface between society and our institutions as it relates to technology. What are our principles around it? What do we think the state of the digital world really is? And how do we tease out what those natural principles are that we should embody in our government, in our institutions and in our society? That's the philosophical underpinning of it. Now let's take a look at some other proposals. So the first one was sent over to me by a, a member over on Locals, Just XUXA, sent me a copy of this, the European Commission. There's a proposal for the regulation of the European Parliament and the Council on the Digital Markets Act. Looks like a 2020 bill out of Brussels want to run through a little bit of it with you here. So here's the explanatory memorandum. This is one of their proposals. Digital services. Now, let me back up. Reasons for and objectives of this proposal. So this thing is for the EU, the European Union. And right out of the gate, I'll tell you this. I don't know much about the EU. I just don't. Right? I'm an American born and raised, and I just don't know much about the legal structure of how that works. I know that and I've been over there a number of times, but I just don't know how it all interfaces very well. And I know that there's you know, a number of different countries and you sort of sign into it. And I've been following the Brexit stuff and I get it, but I just don't understand how this all interfaces. So in other words, what happens with this proposal? Where does it go? I don't know. You know, I don't know what countries have to sign on to it or what the level of the lift is in order to get something like this into effect. But what I do like about it and what I wanted to stop and sort of call your attention to is that they're thinking about a lot of these issues and they've actually done some pretty good homework on this stuff. And they are talking about the same issues that I think apply around the world. And so I think we can take some of this and utilize it in our own legal framework here in the States. So this is the reason, the objectives for the proposal. Digital services have brought important innovative benefits for users. They've contributed to internal market by opening new business opportunities and facilitating cross-border trading. Today, many of them do a wide range of daily activities on there. Large platforms have emerged benefiting from characteristics of the sector, such as strong network effects, often embedded in their own platform ecosystems. They go on, they talk about it. A few large platforms increasingly act as gatekeepers or gateways between business users and end users, and they enjoy an entrenched and durable position, often as a result of the creation of conglomerate ecosystems around their core platform services, which reinforces existing entry barriers. So in the EU, they're talking about the same thing that we've got here, probably talking about the same companies that we have here, right? Your Facebooks, your Googles, your Twitters. They have this massive network effect. Everybody's using them. They have enough resources that they just turn into these massive conglomerates. They gobble up all these other companies. They create their own ecosystems and nobody can leave. And once they're on the top, they pull up the ladder behind them so that other people cannot catch up to them. The analogy here is what Amazon has done. Okay, for a long time during Amazon's growth years, they didn't pay any uh, uh, state sales tax or sales tax, I think in general, just across the, across the country because they didn't have physical locations there. Well, as soon as they got big enough, then they started s establishing physical locations, then they had no problem paying sales tax. But they used that as a major windfall in order to grow so quickly. Now, a competitor to Amazon because the precedent has been set. If they want to open up an Amazon, guess what? They don't get the benefit of not paying taxes for the first 10 years of their company. They got to pay taxes. So it's a significant disadvantage. And that's what they're talking about. Other entry barriers. As such, these gatekeepers have major impact on, they have substantial control over access to, and they're entrenched in digital markets, leading to significant dependencies of many business users on these gatekeepers, which leads in certain cases to unfair behavior vis-a-vis -vis these business users. Negative effects on the contestability of core platform services offered, regulatory initiatives by member states cannot fully address these effects. They need action at the EU level. 
Otherwise, this could lead to fragmentation of the internal market. Right. So this goes through. You can see here a lot of stuff. They got an entire framework for a proposal for an initiative. A lot of stuff. They've got a summary on the estimated impact of expenditures, operational appropriations, current multi-annual financial framework. We're talking, I think, billions of dollars in order to get this done. They've also got monitoring and reporting rules, management and control systems. So we're going to run through some of this here in chapter two. They define what these gatekeepers are. Who are these gatekeepers? And here's their definition, which I thought was pretty interesting. A provider of core platform services. So that's the language that they're using, core platform services, which is a little bit broader than the language that we were using in ours, shall be designated as a gatekeeper if, A, it has a significant impact on the internal market. So that would be the market within the EU. It operates a core platform service, which serves as an important gateway for business users to reach end users. It enjoys an entrenched and durable position in its operations, or it is foreseeable that it will enjoy such a position in the near future. Okay, and so this is kind of directly talking about the existing tech companies, isn't it? It's defining them. It's identifying them with legal language. Here are, here's another slide from the document indicators of results and impact. So they actually have some KPI, some key performance indicators. How are they going to measure to make sure that this plan is working? What is the objective in this first box? To enhance the coherence and legal certainty in the online platform environment in the internal market. What are the operational object objectives for that objective? Limit diverging national regulatory interventions. So if Germany and France and Italy are all passing different rules, that's going to lead to internal fragmentation within the EU. They want to ensure coherent interpretation of their obligations. And how do they measure those things? The number of regulatory interventions at the national level. So how, how many people are, are, else are also jumping in to regulate this stuff? If it's a lot, then we know this isn't working. Another objective is to address gatekeeper platforms, unfair conduct. How do they get there operationally by preventing identified unfair self-preferencing practices? And how do they measure that? They're looking at the number of compliance interve interventions by the commission per gatekeeper platform per year. So they're setting up a commission that's going to be responding to the complaints that the gatekeepers are engaging in unfair self-preferencing practices. They're also going to take a look at the number of sanctions that are doled back out to the platforms. So here, they're, I'm, I'm, appreciative of what they're doing, but it sounds like they're already at this level. They're already talking about the other governmental institutions that they're going to create to help ensure that society is functioning appropriately, right? And they do talk a little bit about some of the principles in the government, but they're sort of working here. How are they applying this stuff to society? That's what that document is about. Same type of story over here. This is another bill here in the United States. I want to give a hat tip over to Larry who sent this over to me. This is from a House representative who goes by the name of Stubbe. Mr. Stubbe introduced the bill. And this is a bill to amend Section 230 of the Communications Act of 1934 to limit the immunity of providers and users of interactive computer services. So currently, the way that this works, Section 230 provides these big tech companies with a lot of protection. If somebody goes on their platform and posts something bad, posts something wrong, they're immune from liability for that as a result of Section 230. What this bill is doing is it's carving out some exceptions, saying you're only pr protected if you're following these, these things. Since you're not, you're not protected anymore. Let's take a look at the bill. It says to amend Section 230 of the Communications Act to limit the immunity of providers. And here is what we're talking about. There's an exception, meaning they're not covered by Section 230 for stifling free expression. You don't get an, ex an exception for that. Paragraphs 1 and 2A shall not apply to a provider of interactive computer service that is the business of practicing or communicating user-generated content during any period during which such provider, one, is dominant in his market, two, makes content moderation decisions pursuant to policies and practices that are not reasonably consistent with the First Amendment of the Constitution. So if they're acting like publishers here, they don't get protection. 
provided that they're dominant in their market. Those are really the only two, the only two rules there. If they're not in comportment with the first amendment, they're dominant in the market. They're accepted from the protections of section 230. And the rule, how do you interpret this? If you're a court, the rule of construction, this paragraph shall be broadly construed to advance the purposes of this section in encouraging the growth of the internet as a forum for a true diversity of discourse, unique opportunities for cultural development and myriad avenues for intellectual activity where lawful political, religious, cultural, social, scientific, and other online content can flourish without discrimination based on viewpoint. Right. I think it's pretty good stuff on that. It's identifying some of the, some of the principles that I think are important. Anti-viewpoint discrimination. We want robust speech. It says here, in general, talking about some of the penalties, in general, if a provider of an interactive computer service that is dominant in its market bans, blocks, downranks, demonetizes in its advertising or other subjects, otherwise subjects, to similar adverse treatment the content of any information content provider that uses interactive computer services by reason of failure to comport with the First Amendment, these are the penalties. An information con content provider that prevails in a civil action under this paragraph may obtain the following damages. Compensatory damages, liquidated damages, we've got punitive damages, we've got treble damages. Then they define a couple things. What does it mean to be dominant in your market? It means with respect to a provider that they have gained substantial sustained market power over any competitors. Actual monopoly control over a market is not required to satisfy uh, the preceding sentence. And the term reasonably consistent with the First Amendment means with respect to the policies and practices of a provider of an interactive computer service that they're conforming to such policies and practice that have already been defined under the First Amendment, taking into extent the feasible consideration of developing capabilities and complexities that comport with the online communication platforms. Not a bad idea. Also, I think trying to focus on institutions. So it's actually modifying the U.S. law in order to see how that impacts society. So when we're talking about a bill of rights and a declaration, we're, we're lower down here. Okay. We're making sure we're protecting these things. This is where I, where I think the conversation uh, really should be rather than sort of, you know, to me, it's like using a bunch of duct tape to fix something. Okay. Just, you know, fix it right. It's falling over. Just get a new one. Go out there, get the real materials. Stop trying to duct tape everything up. So the, the idea here is what are the principles? What are we really declaring about this new digital world? And then from there, we can really dial in on what the Bill of Rights should look like and then draft a final amendment. All right, so I wanted to share some feedback that I got. Got some very cool stuff from Philip, sent an email over and uh, had, had a lot of good points about terms and services. So he said uh, the length of them. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to respect everybody's anonymity. So we're just using first names and I'm not including, of course, any contact information. If you send anything over to us at tips at rrlawaz.com that you want me to share, you, you say, hey, it's fine if you share my name or my email or my contact information, I'll do it. But my default is, is to not personally identify you. I'll use a first name or I'll use uh, your handle. If you include that, your, your handle over on locals. All right. So that's, that's, uh, that's the policy. Now it says the length of them terms and services. They're 30 pages of printed out, it, it's a, which is a lot. My registration on a newspaper site timed out when I read them, I'm a fast reader, but I couldn't read them entirely. The requirement says that you have to read and understand them. You have to agree to them. An honest person cannot tick the box agreeing to them. If ticking the box means you've read and understood them. He says they're full of nonsense that you have to agree to. One agreement that I had to accept because my employer was posting my pay slips there wanted me to agree to their name and logo were trademark and therefore I couldn't use them myself. But as they are trademarked, I'm prevented from using them regardless of whether I agree to or not. But that's the law. So why put things like that in there? Because lawyers get paid to write that stuff. That you have to agree to them all. I tried to book a train ticket somewhere. And after having gone through almost all of them, I had to agree to all of the terms and conditions. I canceled that process. Then I booked by phone where I didn't have to agree or read any of that stuff. 
Finally, I have an example of a ridiculous condition, and he's referencing the WhatsApp terms and conditions, where there was a lot of uproar about that. Basically saying, if you agree to it, then WhatsApp, WhatsApp, I think, I don't use it, can contact all, all of the people in your phone, and you give them permission to do that. So I think that's pretty important. Another very good uh, contribution over from At No Doubt. And he said, you provided a great start and your approach provided a good framework for considering how to address other needs and solve the challenges. For your digital rights, I've added a few that bring in some additional concepts or provide an alternative amendment to modify in order to bring about some of your goals. I recognize they still need work. Additions, the right to the public square, which is something we talked about yesterday. You know, I think the public square is now largely going online. Extend the requirement to honor, honor rights to entities from the 14th Amendment. The right to technology, sort of a Second Amendment equivalent, and replace the word user with citizen. And he actually sent, I'm not going to share the whole document because, again, I, I want to sort of not overly expose people, but the attached document provides the text and comments and on thoughts behind the recommendation. Although I introduced the personal profile concept, we need to ask whether it provides adequate protection of someone's personal profile or their true identity. And so he sent over about four or five pages of this, but he basically was saying, this is the name in this first column. This is the name of the uh, amendment or the issue that you're trying to solve. So the right to technology, sort of a Second Amendment equivalent. The right to develop, possess, and use technology shall not be infringed. This includes all types of technologies, including but not limited to security, scanning, assessment, assessment, other defensive or offensive technologies. Interesting idea. Very interesting, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty broad. That's providing a lot of freedoms. I like it. Perhaps remove use as technology for nefarious purposes should not be protected. However, the concern is they will put handcuffs on technologies to make use of them for legitimate purposes impossible. So this is, these are the issues, right? And this is the debate that we're talking about. We're talking about these principles and about the state of nature. What is the state of nature of the digital world? Well, the internet provides value and danger. The ingenuity of people to use and adapt technology to protect themselves or to develop value defies estimation or prediction. Using technology against another system requires permission. Congress did try to outlaw technologies used for penetration tests a year or two ago. Okay, so we have to understand that. What is the state of nature? What are the principles that we want to embody? Citizen. Replace user with citizen. The Constitution defines citizen and avoids the unintended negative impact by citizens of other nations on our country's resources. Digital freedom of speech. The internet shall have no laws abridging the freedom of speech expression or of the press or of the users to peaceably assemble on the internet. Why limit it to the internet as it should apply to future platforms? Yeah, right? So that's another very, very good point. Okay, what if, and I think, I think we talked about this a little bit last week. What if you say, hey, we're going to protect the internet and you have all these billionaires who just say, that's fine. We're going to create the billionaire internet, the billinet. Built, Builtnet. And if you want to come on our new platform where we have all of the same resources and all of the same network effect and all of the same, we're going to pick up Facebook, move it off your internet, and we're going to put it over here. And everybody's just going to move and you can't regulate that new platform, whatever that looks like. Starlink internet, right? It's a good point. Right to digital personhood. All users shall have the right to exist in their true identity on the internet, not allowed to disclose a customer's identity, authenticators, or data, the right to recover true identity. And so no doubt had pages of that. Outstanding. Thank you, no doubt, for that. Very, very, very interesting stuff. And so I'm going to ask, no doubt, if we can discuss the rest of his proposals. And if you have anything that you would like to share as well, please send that stuff over. I want to show you one more thing I thought was a very interesting idea, and then we'll talk about some of the next steps, and we'll get out of here on this Saturday. So Chris Wiseman, who's very active over on Locals, he has a new sort of novel approach to addressing some of these issues, and he has uh, sent me some information about this organization called the Free Speech Defense Association with this quote from Frederick Douglass, which I thought was great. To, suppri to, I'm sorry, to suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. Frederick Douglass. And so this is a different concept here, just giving Chris a little bit of a plug, where they're talking about sort of an insurance solution, which is new. I hadn't heard of this. I've, I've seen this for gun rights. I think even some of the other, uh, some of the you know, other podcasters and other speakers and things, they'll, they'll, they'll advertise a lot for this one company. It might even be the NRA that will 
uh, protect you in the event of a shooting. Okay, if you you know fortunately have to shoot somebody, and you basically apply to have them protect you, it's sort of an insurance policy, and they will do that. Right. So if you are now facing criminal charges, they'll hire a lawyer for you. If you're facing civil charges, they'll fund you for, you know, $150,000 or whatever that is, sort of like a little protection plan. And so this Free Speech Defense Association is sort of talking about that same concept in the version of free speech. What happens if you get to platform? What happens if you have to go sue to, you know, restore your account? And so sort of a private sector solution to use the courts and use the litigation in order to maintain those rights. I talk a lot about sort of the bubble of liberty just constantly shrinking around us. And this is a different way to consolidate assets. And so, uh, you know, another project that's out there in this space, if you want to go connect with Chris Wiseman over on Locals. All right. So lastly, kind of consolidating some of this stuff. Here is what I think is next for this little project, at least in terms of my small sliver of contribution for it. What I would like to do is get some of this stuff organized on a monday.com. This is a, this is a different platform that we use. You can go take a look at it. It is, I think, conducive to input from a number of different people. We use this as our, at our firm for a uh, project management tool. We use a lot of this actually monday.com. We use a lot of it to actually use this as a uh, to-do list. And I organize a lot of my big goals and stuff in this platform. And so what I think I want to do is organize all of this into a list that we can start working on, create a global universe of digital principles that we can then take community input on just for the principles portion of this. Okay. Not the, the actual writing. We're talking about what the state of nature is and what the principles are. Then we'll get some community input. We'll vote on a final list. You can vote on monday.com. Then start talking about this. What is a declaration of the digital rights? And that's just the first step in getting you know the ball moving forward towards an actual bill of rights. These are the natural, this is the state of nature of the digital world. These are the principles that we hold to be dear that are inalienable. From that, these, this is a declaration of the rights. And from there, you can establish your bill of rights. Then you have a constitutional amendment. Then that goes to the senators and the House representatives around the country. So let's take a quick look and see if we've got anybody in the chat that has any thoughts about some of this stuff. All right. So I do not have the usual uh, Miss Faith here to, uh, to clip some of this stuff for me. So what we're going to do is we're just going to wrap it up right there. I want to say if you do have any comments, any, anything that you want to add to this conversation, please send it over to us. I get all of the emails that go to tips at rrlawaz.com. They just go there because it kind of helps keep things separated in my inbox. So I get them, send them to tips at rrlawaz.com. If you have any thoughts on this, if you have any ideas on what might make this more robust, if you have any disagreements with this, especially if you think, Hey, I'd actually love disagreements. If you say, Hey, this is stupid. Here's why, uh, this would never work because X, Y, and Z. I would like to understand that. And I've, I've had some people, you know, say things like, well, you, you, you don't have a right to, to go speak wherever you want. You know, this is all private. And I, under, I understand that. But we've also we've also identified certain immutable characteristics in this country that we just say you know, this supersedes your right to a private you know, discrimination. And I just don't know how this would be different than some of those other arguments. So if you have opposition to that, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, my friends, thanks so much for tuning in for this special Saturday edition of the Digital Bill of Rights. We're going to leave it there. I'm going to get moving forward. I think I got some final Valentine's things that I got to figure out, Ugh, but we're going to do that. And I'm hopeful that all of you have already done the same. Everybody have a very tremendous uh, post-impeachment acquittal weekend either celebrate or mourn. We're going to be back here, same time, same place on Monday. 5 p.m. Arizona time, 4 p.m. in California, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Bye-bye.